Hello, today I'm going to be talking about the Affirm trial and um, how it relates to the findings with regard to stillbirth and stillbirth prevention. So um, initially um, the Affirm trial's hypothesis was that the rates of stillbirth would be reduced by introduction of a package of care consisting of strategies for increasing pregnant women's awareness of the need for prompt reporting of decreased federal movements, followed by a management plan for identification of placental insufficiency with timely birth in confirmed cases. In their protocol, um, they said that they were going to do the trial because stillbirth dropped by 30% after the introduction of a similar package of care in Norway, but the um, efficiency of this intervention and possible adverse effects and implications for service delivery weren't tested in that um, trial through randomisation. Um, they claimed that it wasn't randomised and therefore consisted of only level 2-3 evidence um, but in spite of that had led to recommendations from ARCOG, um, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists in the UK, that women should be advised to be aware of their baby's individual pattern of movements and if they were concerned about a reduction or cessation that they should contact their maternity care provider. Um, so the bottom line was that they planned to formally test using gold standard methodologies, whether a similar package of intervention really does decrease stillbirth and whether it does any harm, that is increasing rates of cesarean section or induction of labour, and how it can be implemented to best effect in a different setting um, in the UK. So this is why they said they um, did it. Um, before I go too much further, I just want to talk about what a step wedge cluster randomised control trial is, um, because it is important to know that in such a trial, hospitals and not people are randomised to the timing of the introduction of an intervention. Um, so the idea is that all clusters uh, receive the new intervention at some stage, um, and uh, when they start doing the intervention is determined entirely by chance. Um, it's used when randomising people um, to non-intervention is thought to be unethical or not feasible and really in this case it was both. Um, you can't be randomising people to experience a stillbirth. Um, so the results were that they had um, 33 hospitals uh, were randomly assigned to an intervention um, data were collected from um, more than 409,000 pregnancies, so a huge, great big trial. Um, 157 plus thousand births um, occurred during the control period, or that is before the intervention happened. And uh, 227,000 plus births <coughs> occurred in the intervention period. Um, and that doesn't add up to 409,000 because there was also a washout um, group, so-called washout group, um, where they really didn't pay attention um, to the, the outcomes in that particular group because they could have been tainted um, either way. <clears throat> the incidence of stillbirth um, in the trial was 400, uh, sorry, 4.4 per thousand births during the control period and 4.06 per thousand births in the intervention period. And uh, if you understand that um, uh, line there, it's actually um, not statistically um, significantly different. Um, induction of labour, um, however, was statistically significant, very slightly, um, slightly raised, and the risk of caesarean section was also very slightly raised. So um, one of the, the things that uh, w 
we noted um, when these results came out. Um, in They were published in The Lancet, which is one of the uh, best uh, medical journals in the world. Um, it was published alongside a commentary uh, which was titled Encouraging Awareness of Fetal Movements is Harmful. Um, and uh, there were other headlines that talked about stillbirth movement awareness flops for stillbirth prevention and uh, this one which is slightly kinder, stillbirth um, reduction strategy unproven. So there was quite a bit of, uh, of interest worldwide um, in this um, publication of this particular study. Um, so much so that a group of us, including myself, um, uh, got together and uh, wrote a, um, a editorial to the Journal of Women and Birth, and we titled it called we titled it um, "Reading Beyond the Headlines." And in this uh, particular um, uh, editorial, we talked about. Um, uh, the fact that it's important to look beyond the headlines because stillbirth actually reduced by nearly 9% um, across uh, the cohort um, and this effect, if confirmed in other studies, could actually translate into quite a, a number of um, stillborn babies' lives saved. Um, key, and very importantly, and I'll talk about this further in a minute, awareness was not reported as being assessed at all. Um, the uptake of the AFFIRM intervention um, by clinicians was also not reported as having been assessed, so we actually don't know how well it was implemented um, from the awareness point of view, um, although we do have um, a clue about the implementation of the uh, reduced fetal movement strategy. Um, and therefore we concluded that uh, current practices around awareness raising and clinical management for reduced fetal movements should remain um, unchanged at the very least. Um, so uh, I like to use analogy and um, I'm going to be talking about um, this trial um, by using the analogy of, a, um, a, of an imaginary study. This gorgeous child here is is uh, one of my grandbabies, uh, Mabel, um, and uh, she's very bright and it's actually um, her imaginary study. So it, um, this is called the Hammer Trial, Household Awareness of Manipulative Material Items for Early Readers. The research question for this trial was, does giving young children written information about the appearance of common household items increase their ability or their awareness to locate said items? The approach is a step wedge clustered randomised control trial uh, in which sheds are located and randomised, not the children. Um, the methods are a glossy brochure was produced and given to parents to give to their children, <clears throat> a link to how to talk to children about hammers, a e learning package was sent to all participating families. Um, an earlier observational study showed that children can locate a hammer approximately 30% of the time, so this study was expected to demonstrate at least that. However, only 9% of the children in this study located a hammer, 28% um, got a splinter, and 40% uh, got bitten by a redback um, spider. That's a dangerous spider that lives in Australia. Um, providing parents and children information about hammer appearance is therefore an unproven strategy to raising awareness of what a hammer looks like and may do more harm than good is our um, conclusion. So how reasonable is that conclusion? So if you look at the approach, um, the nature of the sheds, size, the number of hammers in the shed, the state of the shed, um, all actually did need to be assessed. Um, because uh, apart from anything else, um, there might have been the possibility of um, the owner of the shed deciding to tidy it up whilst uh, the trial was on without um, uh, thinking, I guess, that um, this might impact on the um, outcome of the trial. Um, comments about the methods. Um, a glossy brochure was produced and given to the parents to give to the children, but um, we have to understand how the brochure might have been given to the children. Um, was the brochure actually suitable for all age groups, reading ages and cultural groups? Did the parents engage with the study or not? Did the child read it 
themselves or not? Um, and did the parents engage with the e-learning package or not? Um, none of that we actually know from the results of this um, trial. Uh, we do know that 9% of the children could locate a hammer, um, but 28% got a splinter and, as I said, 40% got bitten by a dangerous spider. When you look at um, trials such as this, um, you have to be thinking about um, power and power calculations um, safeguard against the trial failing to detect something that is actually there um, by having enough uh, participant numbers. So participant number is key to um, understanding um, sample size and uh, what's needed as far as um, sample size. So sample size can be a limitation um, if it's too small because it might prevent their findings from being extrapolated. But it's also a problem if you have too large a sample size um, because uh, this may amplify the detection of differences, um, st emphasising statistical differences that are actually not clinically relevant. And also, um, if you look at this picture of Mabel, um, she has come in with a, a, a something that isn't a hammer, um, clearly, um, but we actually don't know if the hammer was there and she didn't recognise it or if it really wasn't um, there and that's why she brought you something else. Also, if you um, think of this um, trial in terms of splinters, hammers and spiders all being um, an, an outcome that has been looked at, um, you have to understand that um, uh, there might only be one hammer in the shed lots of spiders and lots of splinter opportunities and so therefore um, really um, what you have is th more this situation where um, the hammer is actually quite tiny and the splinters and the spiders are actually quite large such that if you see a hammer um, you have um, a much more likelihood of being actually able to see the splinter and the spider so um, I'll talk about that um, a little bit further in a minute. So the conclusion of providing parents and children information about hammer appearance is an unproven strategy to raise awareness of what a hammer looks like and may do more harm than good. Um, probably isn't a reasonable um, justification because we don't know if the brochure was even given to the child, how the content of the brochure was communicated um, to the child. If the child understood what a hammer looked like as a result of reading the pamphlet, if the child already knew what a hammer looked like and so therefore um, didn't um, bother to read the pamphlet or the parents didn't bother to give the brochure to the child because they thought the child would already know what a hammer might look like, uh, the child had previous experience in locating a hammer and the parents knew that. We also don't know how long the child was encouraged to look in the shed if their parents went with them, if the parents engaged with the e-learning package, if the children who were harmed were a subset of the children, um, that is children who read the brochure on their own, went to the shed alone, or children who liked playing with spiders. So all of those questions are actually not answered in the Hammer trial, and as it stands is not actually answered in the Affirm trial findings either. So is that conclusion fair and reasonable? You'd have to say, perhaps not. So a randomised controlled trial is definitely a gold standard. There is no doubt when you are comparing one uh, objective thing against another, particularly if um, the one thing is a placebo and the other is a, um, a, 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 a um, drug that um, you're testing. A randomised control might not be the gold standard when the intervention is subjective or open to interpretation, such as um, occurred with the AFFIRM um, study. Uh, this thing called equipoise um, is met or not met, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, and um, sample size, um, which I'll talk about further. So the intervention for AFFIRM was a, consisted of a pamphlet to be given to pregnant women. Um, but we're actually not told in the uh, write-up um, that uh, if, if it was given at a, a particular gestation, um, it just simply says about 20 weeks. 
if a standardized script was used you know here's the pamphlet here's why it's important to read it this is what it will tell you um, if understanding was measured um, if awareness was measured as a result of being given the pamphlet and how many care providers actually ex accessed the e-learning package so um, when Norman and others talk about the intervention package might not have had sufficiently um, sufficient effect to initiate behavioural change in clinicians and pregnant women, um, you'd have to say that that um, is um, certainly true. Also, um, intervention fidelity is something that needs to be always considered, particularly in a behavioural um, sense. So this refers to the reliability and validity of the clinical intervention um, that's used in a randomised controlled trial. So it needs to be um, appropriately performed and um, able to be repeated over and over and over again, the same intervention done in the same way. Um, so this is why a drug randomised control trial is, um, is the gold standard, because um, the same drug um, is given over and over again, same dose, exactly the same thing. Um, whereas we can't be sure about this with a, a behavioural intervention. Um, this slide is actually really important to look at. Um, it's courtesy of um, Professor Hazel um, when he presented to the Star Legacy Foundation recently. But if you look at the difference between the um, uh, control or the pre-intervention um, intervention um, and then the actual intervention, the affirm intervention, there really wasn't a heck of a lot of difference uh, between the two. So if you look at the information, parents were still given information. One was a leaflet that had been developed by ARCOG, the other was a leaflet that had been developed by a firm, by the affirm group. Um, uh, the uh, information highlighted in red uh, is I guess very slightly different um, because it says if they are concerned about a reduction or cessation in fetal movements after 28 weeks they should contact their maternity um, unit and uh, in the intervention women are advised to contact their maternity unit if they were concerned and no gestation. So uh, very minimal um, differences actually between the um, intervention and the control both required uh, you to take a history, both required you to have a listen for the heartbeat, both required you to do a CTG. Um, the ultrasound protocol was um, quite different and then the option for um, delivery was um, different because prior to the trial there was no recommendation for, to deliver um, babies based on just um, an episode of reduced fetal movements. And in the intervention, there was um, a recommendation to consider induction of labour um, for women um, uh, greater than uh, 40 weeks on their first presentation or with recurrent reduced fetal movements after 37 weeks gestation. So that's a, a difference between the two um, recommendation for uh, birth. Um, while the trial was going on, and even before the trial started, there was available information about significance of fetal movements for both clinicians and women aside from um, the intervention, which is an important thing uh, to know. Um, equipoise is uh, when there should be genuine uncertainty in the expert medical community about the preferred treatment before a randomised control trial um, is allowed to be conducted there should exist no decisive evidence that the intervention will be superior to existing treatments or effective at all. Um, and I would have to say that um, in uh, this particular case, that probably wasn't met as a criteria. Going back to uh, Professor Hazel's slide, um, where he's talking about um, uh, the inflation, I guess, of, of the hammer and the splinters and the spider um, in, with respect to a firm. So he says to detect a 10% fall in stillbirth from um, 4 per thousand to 3.6 per thousand would require 371,000 participants in each arm of the trial, which 
uh, didn't occur um, in a firm. However, because induction of labour and um, caesarean section are far more common, to detect a 10% increase in induction of labour from 30% to 33% would only require a little over um, 3,000 uh, participants. So you can see that if you are powered for stillbirth, you are well and truly overpowered for uh, detecting um, slight differences in um, induction of labour. Other problems are that um, clusters are um, slated, I guess, to receive the experimental intervention, but it doesn't mean that all participating subjects will actually receive the experimental intervention. So the hospital um, signs on, but that doesn't mean that um, the people attending the hospital will actually get uh, the intervention. Um, and a step bridge cluster randomised control often doesn't meet plans, planned sample size, um, and this is the case for this particular trial. So is the randomised control trial always gold standard? Well, there's some points to note. Um, probably the uh, special status awarded to randomised control trial is unwarranted. Um, and um, which research method actually is best will depend on what you're trying to discover and what is already known. In the case of stillbirth, much is actually already known from observational research, case control cohort studies, and these studies are a source of high level evidence, particularly um, if pulled in an IPD analysis such as um, occurred um, with our recent information about um, safe first sleep position in late pregnancy. Um, at this point, you can't know how to use trial results without first understanding how the results from randomised control trials relate to knowledge that you already possess about the world, and much of this knowledge is obtained through other methods. And it's imperative to understand that randomised control trials are a form of research design, and this design is not always appropriate for all forms of research needs, for example, rare outcomes, uh, which are actually best studied using case control um, uh, design. Can a randomised controlled trial do harm? Well, I think that um, uh, perhaps that's the case. Uh, Deaton and Cartwright say that the gold standard or truth view of a randomised controlled trial um, actually does harm because it undermines the obligation of science to reconcile the results from randomised controlled trial with other evidence that we already have in a process of cumulative understanding. Um, and that really hasn't happened um, as a result of the affirmed trial. Um, so Norman saying that the um, RFM care package did not reduce the risk of stillbirth, um, the benefits of a policy that promotes awareness of reduced fetal movements remains unproven, has led directly to the uh, conclusion, very um, inappropriately, encouraging awareness of fetal movements is harmful, which actually this trial um, didn't show. What did a firm show? It showed that when women report decreased fetal movements and they are cared for in a standardised way that includes a recommendation for delivery, there is a slight increase in induction of labour and caesarean section and the stillbirth rate goes down. Um, and uh, if you think about that, it's kind of logical. If you are, uh, if really the only difference between the intervention um, pre and post uh, the introduction of a firm into a hospital was recommendation for birth versus no recommendation for birth, um, then if a baby was uh, detected as uh, being at increased risk and was delivered, um, then um, of course, the induction of labour and caesarean section rate went up slightly uh, because they were actually acting on um, a fetal compromise and therefore it makes sense that the stillbirth rate actually went down um, to the degree that it did. What didn't a firm show? It actually didn't show that awareness of fetal movements reduces the risk of stillbirth because no measure of awareness was used. Thank you for your attention.